Good evening and welcome to Wednesday Night Refuel with Seven Locks Baptist Church. I'm Pastor Kyle and thanks for making us a part of your week. Whether you are watching this live or watching this later on in the week, uh, we just appreciate you stopping by and spending some time with us in prayer and in scripture. And so tonight, and we're going to dive right into it, I want to uh, read a passage to you from Jeremiah chapter 2 verses 4 through 13 says this, Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, all you clans of the house of Israel. Hear what the Lord says. What fault did your fathers find in me that they strayed so far from me? They followed worthless idols and became worthless themselves. They did not ask, Where is the Lord who brought us up out of Egypt and led us through the barren wilderness, through a land of deserts and rifts, a land of drought and darkness, a land where no one travels and no one lives. I brought you into a fertile land to eat its fruit and rich produce, but you came and defiled the land and made my inheritance detestable. The priests did not ask, Where is the Lord? Those who deal with the law did not know me. The leaders rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal following worthless idols. Therefore, I bring charges against you again, declares the Lord, and I will bring charges against your children's children. Cross over to the coast of Katim and look, send to Kedar and observe closely. See if there has ever been anything like this. Has a nation ever changed its gods, yet they are not gods at all? But my people have exchanged their glory for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, O heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. My people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So when I was a youth minister 20 years ago, and yes, that hurt to say 20 years ago, because that would make me, well, I don't want to get into it. But 20 years ago, when I was a youth minister back in Texas, I took my youth to a mini golf place that is very a very once famous chain down in Texas known as Putt-Putt Golf. And we went because they not only had mini, miniature golf, but they also had bumper boats and go-karts and it was a great place to be when you were a teenager it was a great place to be as a poor college student who got to go and have fun and act like a kid again but I had two of my students who decided that it would be a great idea to jump in the pool of water by one of the holes of mini golf now this was not a naturally fed little pond it just caught water and it was stagnant water and I don't know how familiar you are with stagnant water but you let it stagnate long enough and it stinks it smells foul and it turns green because of algae grows in it it's just not a pleasant thing and these two gentlemen jumped in it thinking they were hilarious and funny they were the only two that laughed because when they came up out of the water, the only word I can describe the smell that came off of those two guys was wretched. They stunk so bad that the rest of the youth group crowded into the front of the church van, you know, with seat belts, of course, but they, there was a small enough group and we had a big enough van back in the day that they crowded up front and let those two guys stay at the very back with the back window open because it was one of those old church vans where you could you know pop open the back windows yeah you know, if you grew up in the 80s or 90s you know what I'm talking about <clears throat> but we had to air those dudes out the whole way home they were rank now I bring this up because it fits with what Jeremiah is talking about here at the end of this passage, and we'll get to that in just a moment, this idea of stagnant water. Stagnant water 
It is not something you want to drink. It's not something that you should drink. In fact, if you do, you can get really sick. Because you can tell water is a lot like chicken. A good friend of mine who has advanced degrees in poultry science said that the way to tell if, if chicken is good or not is chicken has no smell. If it has a smell, get rid of it. Water is pretty much the same way. If it doesn't smell, for the most part, probably okay to drink. If it stinks, get away from it because it's not good for you. And yet at times as human beings we struggle because we are so prone to try to make our own way and we we have this bent within us to pull away from the things that really give us life towards something else i mean you think about this is water right here i remember years ago i didn't want to drink water because it Here's the funny part, had no flavor. So I drank a lot of soda, which tasted good and, and had caffeine in it, which was nice before I drank coffee. But now I drink coffee, so I don't really need it for that. But it, I didn't realize at the time that it tasted good, but it was tearing up my insides, making me sick. It made... Uh, and it had a lot of things in it to where if you read the ingredient list, you're like, oh, okay, this is not good for me. Yet human beings have this bent towards these things that are not good for us. They have the appearance of being good. And we are so bent on proving our ability to solve our own problems. And we have a really short memory to know just how much God has done in our lives. That we, not realizing what we're turning to, turn towards the equivalent of stagnant water. And that's what Jeremiah is saying to the people of Judah as he begins the second chapter of the book of Jeremiah. By the way, I know that the Old Testament prophets are, are not the easiest books to get your mind around at times. At least I know they used to have that stigma for me, but I would love to encourage you to dive into the book of Jeremiah. It is an incredible book in so many ways and has so many things that even though it was written a long time ago it speaks right now to us i think it fits the situation that we find ourselves in and, and i'm not just talking about 2021 i preached on this a few years ago it was really rich and applicable then it's really rich and applicable now so i encourage you to dive into the book of jeremiah so what's going on in the verses that i read to you well, the Lord is making a challenge or bringing charges against the people of Israel, particularly the people of Judah, because they have turned their backs on God. And it is something God is lamenting, their unfaithfulness, and pointing out by asking questions just how far they've strayed, where he says, what fault did your fathers find with me? I mean, what is it that I've done why have you strayed from me? Your fathers, your people established for you this practice of worshiping idols instead of worshiping me. They're worthless. They're not real. I'm the one true God. I rescued you from slavery in Egypt. I brought you out. I led you through the wilderness, through a perilous land, a land of droughts, a land where no one travels. And you know what's funny? There are still those places today where as much as the tourism industry is a very booming business, well, most of the time it is, not so much right now, but given another six, eight months, I think you'll see some of that begin to, to come back to life. But usually, if you look at on the, all the travel websites, which is a very big hobby of mine because I love to travel, you will see like the top 10 destinations to go in Europe, the top 10 destinations to go in Asia, you name it, top 10, top 10 destinations in the United States, and you'll find them. But if you look hard enough, you can find the places that nobody goes for many reasons. One, they're not aesthetically pleasing. Two, there's not much to do. And three, they're just flat out dangerous. 
there are places if you uh, look at various government agencies, I get notifications saying, please don't go to this country. It is not safe for you to be there. And the reason I bring this up is because God is saying, I've, I've brought you through these places where nobody goes. And I kept you safe. I brought you to this fertile land of promise. And I invited you to come in and eat its fruit and its produce and enjoy living in this land after wandering in obscurity for 40 years because of your disobedience. I led you out of that and gave you a homeland. And what did you do? Jeremiah says you defiled it by making your inheritance detestable and the people who should have led you, the priests, they didn't ask, where is the Lord? Instead, they rebelled and led people into the worship of idols, into the worship of Baal, which was a Canaanite god from that region. The people of Israel from the time of Joshua, really the time of Judges to be more a little bit more specific, all the way through the exile, up to the point of the exile, they had issues with Baal, Baal worship, or Baal worship, however you want to say it. There's a thousand different ways to say it. In Texas, it's one syllable, Baal. But Baal is, I believe, how you really pronounce it. But this was a false god that, that promised fertility, promised success in farming and agriculture, which was a big deal. And the Israelites just embraced that. And God... He's asking through, through Jeremiah, wait, wait a minute, guys. Do you not realize that we have a relationship? We have, I made you a promise and you made me a promise. And I've kept my part and I'm not really sure what's going on. And he says, go, go ask around to your neighbors. Has anyone ever abandoned their God? And in fact, they didn't. If you study the ancient Near Eastern world, you'll see that that different groups of people had their own sets of gods. The Egyptians, the Babylonians, the Persians, etc., uh, etc. Et the Sumerians, if you want to go real old school, not Sumerians, but Sumerians, uh, they had their own concept of what deities were and things of that nature, and they carried that. And God is saying to them, but I created you as a people. I made a people for myself through your ancestors, through Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And now you're tossing me away. You're ex exchanging the glory of God for things that are worthless. And the Lord says, be appalled. Be appalled at this, O heavens. Not simply be upset or be convicted, but be appalled. That, that feeling of complete and utter disgust. That's the way that the people of Judah should be feeling right about now. And you need to understand the context of this. Jeremiah is writing this. He's a prophet that had, um, during his whole span of ministry, four or five decades in the land of Judah, he spoke the word of the Lord. And he fought with most of the priests of that day because the priests who claimed to be of God were constantly making fun of him. And Jeremiah's preaching one thing and they're over on the other corner preaching something different. And Jeremiah said, oh, listen, I heard from the Lord. And all of these priests are encircling him and laughing at him going, no, you didn't. I mean, this is a, he, he has one king who has his back. A guy by the name of Josiah, whose story is incredible. Uh, you can in keyword search them on your favorite Bible website. Probably, and I haven't tried the search too much on my, the Bible app that I have. But, or if you if you want to go old school, you can look up Josiah in the Concordance. Go read his story. He's an incredible guy. And here's what makes him so incredible: his grandfather is the worst and most wicked and vile king of the people of Judah. It was a guy named Manasseh, and he was a he was awful. He was wretched. He, he condoned child sacrifices. He led the people in all kinds of idol worship. Everything that you could think of a, that a king should not do, especially one 
called to lead the people towards God, Manasseh did it. In fact, there are some who have even speculated that Manasseh is way more evil than even King Ahab and Jezebel of the northern kingdom who clashed with the prophet Elijah. Probably famil more familiar with them because though that's a story that's a little bit more well known. But Ahab and Jezebel are wicked, vile people, especially Jezebel. And Ahab is, is no saint. But Manasseh is worse than him. He was a monster. And that, that's the world. His reign is the one where Jeremiah is growing up. And that's what he's preaching against, is, is a culture that has turned their back. And not even a culture, a people who have turned their back on their God. And this is the message that God gives them. He says, what are you doing? Who? No one has done this before. No one has abandoned their God, especially me, because I'm real. All these other gods, they're not real. I'm real. And Jeremiah breaks it down. And he says something in verse 13 that I think is, is really important to key on. The last verse of the passage that I read you. But not certainly not the last in the chapter. It says, My people have committed two sins. First of all, they have forsaken me, the spring of living water, and have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. So, in Jeremiah's day, there was no running water. All of the things you hear about the Roman aqueducts and things of that nature, that's several, at least several hundred years before this. Probably about four or five, to be exact. So th that's technology that hasn't been discovered. So how do you get your water? Well, you go to the well, and you get your water, and you take it back to outside your house. There's a big pot. I think most of the time they were made of clay. Giant pots that were called cisterns. And you would pour your water in there and make sure it was filled up so that way in the heat of the day when you needed a drink of water you didn't have to walk all the way back out to the well and, and that's not an easy process of getting water you could just dip it in your cistern and you have your water to drink but what Jeremiah is saying is the way the people have turned their backs on him they've come to the point where they're digging their own cisterns they're digging their own wells and the water that's in them is stagnant. It's not good to drink. It's dangerous. And their, their cisterns that they're placing it in are broken to the point they can't hold water at all. You know, you, you've heard the term, most likely, that argument does not hold water. Jeremiah is saying that a long time ago before it's popular. He's saying, your argument that, oh, you got this and you got this all figured out, that doesn't hold water. In fact, it's cracked and it's leaky. Have you ever tried to drink any liquid out of a cup that's got a hole in it or a crack? Well, first of all, it might pinch your finger. But two, when you're holding it, it leaks out everywhere. It makes a mess. Or if you notice, back in the day when, when styrofoam cups were used a, lot, a little bit more than they are now, uh, especially, I, I don't know how it was for you, but when I was, uh, that's what we had at Vacation Bible School. So they give us the Kool-Aid and the Styrofoam cup. And so every now and then, somehow a hole would get punched in it. I mean, things happen, I'm not sure. But you notice that it's dripping on your finger. And then you notice you got it on your white shirt. And that's going to be a fun explanation when you get home. But you notice that it's got a little hole in it. So what do you do? What did you go get another cup? Well, of course not. When you're nine years old, it's a challenge. So you drink it as fast as you can because you don't want to lose your Kool-Aid. But the thing that is supposed to be giving the people of Judah life, what God is saying is, you've forsaken me. You've forsaken me. The thing that I can, I'm the one who can give you life. I'm the spring of living water. And you turned your back on me. You dug your own wells that have nothing but poisonous water. 
and the things that are supposed to hold your water to sustain you, they're leaking everywhere and falling out. And, and that's the choice you've made. And I think it's easy for us to, to think about, oh my gosh, I can't believe that, that people would turn their backs on God in that way. But as human beings, like I said, this, this is a bent that we all struggle with. Something we all share is this tendency to, yes, we know God is good. And yes, God, God, we love God. But, but sometimes there is something within us. We still try to fix things on our own. Or we look to things to give us hope in life when God really is the only answer. I mean... We're putting all of our hope in a lot of different directions right now. But in the end, it's God that's going to make all of that work and God that's going to bring us through. But it's so easy right now to want to find something either to entertain us, to take our minds off of things, or, or to, to find, be in a quest for knowledge or, or find things to be upset about. I don't know. But there are all these things that we look to. And what Jeremiah is saying is, hey man, look to God. And the great news is that if, if in the past we've looked for comfort or we've looked for some way to make our own peace or to solve our own problems or to find our own fulfillment and we still keep doing an assessment on the things that are supposed to be holding that water for us and they're cracked and it's all falling to pieces. I have good news for you. This is the words of Jesus in John chapter 7. Verse 37, Jesus is preaching at the Feast of Tabernacles. And he says this on the last day after he's already dealt with a lot of scrutiny. He stands up and he says in a loud voice, this is John seven thirty-seven: If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, Streams of living water will flow from within them. And by this, he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to later receive. Up to that point, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. See the parallel there? Jeremiah says the people, or God says through Jeremiah, the people have rejected God, the spring of living water. And then here Jesus says, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. And streams of living water will flow through him. See, that's the amazing thing that, that all of Scripture is building up to the work and ministry of Jesus in the preparation of God's people to become the church and carry that ministry on until He returns. But as human beings, we are thirsty. We are all in need. We're all parts. There is a longing within us that has grown even more intense over the last almost year. It'll be a year next month. It's crazy. It feels like 12. But there's a longing within us to be replenished, to be renewed. And Jesus says, Come to me if anyone is thirsty. Let him come and drink, and streams of living water will flow out of him. Talking about the Holy Spirit, same thing Jeremiah is. The Holy Spirit had not yet come, what John says, but it would make sense later to the apostles and to the rest of the church. But I love that verse because it's a reminder that the living water, the thing that we need to sustain us, to refresh us, to renew us is the presence of God at work in our heart. We can look for it in a million other places. We will not find it. But Jesus says, oh, anyone, if you're those, maybe you know me and you've been trying to figure it out on your own, come back, drink again and be renewed. Reconnect with the Spirit that's already living within you. Be replenished. Or maybe there's someone who has no relationship with Jesus, doesn't even know what that means. 
and has looked a thousand other places. And they're just here tonight. They're not entirely sure why they're watching this video, but you're here. Is there a way for, you might ask, is there a way for me to be renewed, to find that life? And the answer is absolutely. Simply to come to Jesus and say, I need you. I need to be forgiven. I need to be renewed. And the promise is there every time when we're thirsty, come and drink. And we'll find the replenishment that we need. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, for your grace and mercy. God, forgive us when we try to replenish or find that life away from you. But thank you for gently leading us home and giving within us a desire to be made new. And God, we thank you. You are faithful to bring that renewal as we ask. Lord, we love you. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our Wednesday night refuel. If you're watching this live, I want to say a special hello to you. I want to say thank you to all of you who are going to watch this later on, perhaps tonight, maybe even Saturday morning with a cup of coffee. Uh, whenever you uh, spend time with us, we're just glad that you stopped by. Thank you so much. We love to hear from you in the comments. Uh, you can reach us uh, on our website at sevenlocksbaptist.org and find out more information about our church. Uh, there's a contact uh, page. Maybe you've been watching this for a while and you'd like to introduce yourself. Please feel free to send us a message uh, via that or sevenlocksbaptistchurch at gmail.com. We'd love to get to know you if uh, you are um, not in the general area or if you are in the general area. Either way, we just appreciate you spending some time with us and more than anything, spending some time praying with us and studying the scriptures together. We'll be back again live Sunday morning at 11 a.m. on YouTube and Facebook from the sanctuary. Uh, cannot wait to worship with you then. I just finished the message that I'm going to bring on Sunday morning and I'm super excited about what God is, is saying and how God is going to work. So I hope that you will come and be a part of that with us. Connect with us either in person or online. Uh, there is yet another snow ice event possibly coming Saturday night into Sunday. So we'll see what uh, we have to do about that. But we are hoping to gather in person again and also online as well. But however you worship with us, we're always glad to have you and always ready to meet you where you are. So until Sunday morning, have a great rest of the week and we'll see you soon. Good night.